working. Good evening, comrades. Thank you for joining us. It's our second session in our new sub-series, Marx and Party Building. We thought we're spending about 10, 12 sessions. We'll see how these things go on the question of Marx and Engels' involvement with practical party politics. Um, this is misconception that Marx and Engels uh, spend their time just sitting in the library and writing stuff which they did a lot of, uh, if anybody who's got the collected works at home will know, but they also got involved very, very actively in a number of organizations. And tonight, pleased to have Kevin Bean with us, who's talking about, um, the, the title of the talk is From, From the Communist League to the First International. So without further ado, fire away. Okay, thanks, Tina, and uh, thanks, comrades, for the invite to take part. Um, I've uh, I've put a number of links um, up on, uh, I hope they've gone up onto the page, and these are links to the Marxist Internet Archive, so you should be able to just click onto them and go to some of the things I'm referring to. Um, one of the reasons, uh, one of the reasons is that quite a lot of the material, which was perhaps more widely available in book form uh, in the past, um, is now largely held on internet archives. So um, a book like this one by David Fernbach from the early 70s, which was um, you know, quite widely available you know, in, in well, mainstream bookshops, particularly in universities, is now you know, quite difficult to get hold of. So um, I'm going to refer to some of the documents because one of the things I hope that comes out of the sessions is that you actually look at what Marx and Engels uh, write, and that you you try to you know look at what they're saying and the ways that they say it. Um, so this is really designed to sort of take us back to um, basics in that sense. But also many of the documents and many of the many of the things that we're looking at are not often covered, or at least not deeply studied. I think by many people on the left, you know, comrades on the left, and many sort of good summaries. And indeed, if you look at on most left groups, there will be articles and um, you know material about this. But I think it's always useful to go look, go and look back at what Marx and Engels actually said themselves. Um, the, these sessions are really looking at the idea of what Marx and Engels thought about the idea of party and program. And I suppose because this is a an important issue for us at the moment. Um, both in terms of what we mean by a party, indeed what sort of programme it, uh, it should have and how it should be built, and indeed its relationship with all sorts of other movements, that these are often quite urgent questions. But what I'm not uh, suggesting that we do is simply take uh, Marx's, um, particularly Marx, because he's more directly involved in this initial period, take his practice as a sort of blueprint and just say, well, let's just repeat it. Because in many ways, I think, certainly in the first international, Marx and Engels are sort of finding their way. And um, much of what they do, particularly towards the late 1860s, is a sort of response or um, um, a development, not only of their earlier work, but also a recognition of some sort of changes and some of the experiences. So that, for example, um, as we will come to in a few sessions time, what happens in Germany with the creation of um, clearly social democratic parties, parties which are formally and then largely become committed to Marxism, a very different experience, I think, than, than the Marx encounters in uh, England. Uh, or indeed in um, some of the uh, other uh, French-speaking countries that will be important in the international. So I think what we're looking at here is, is in some ways the development of Marx's ideas, both from sort of first principles, but also in terms of practical experience. Um, what I want to begin with, and it's, uh, it is on the, the link, it's a letter that Marx wrote in February 1860 to an old comrade um, 
um, Freilingrad, who's a, a poet and a, a former revolutionary. And the, the letter is, is in full, but I'm going to summarize the main points of it. It's perhaps not um, it's perhaps not clear what's going on with the letter because it actually refers to a series of uh, criminal cases and trials in which all sorts of accusations are being made against Marx and indeed other people. And that doesn't necessarily concern us. But what Marx says in the letter, he says, uh, since November 1852, that's eight years ago, when on my suggestion, the Communist League was dissolved, I've not belonged to any secret or open society. And thus the party in this ephemeral meaning has not existed for me for the past eight years. I am convinced that my theoretical work benefits the working classes more than participation in any sort of lead or for which the time is passed on the continent. If you're a poet, and you know, um, Prilingrat was a poet, um, I am a critic, and I really have enough of the experiments carried out between 1849 and 1852. The League, like hundreds of other societies, was an episode in the history of the party, which is growing spontaneously everywhere on the soil of contemporary society. This, um, this letter was um, the, um, uh, was known to people in Germany. It actually appeared in a, a summary form in, um, in Die Neue Zeit, the uh, SPD's theoretical journal just before the First World War. Um, and quite a lot of the material that may well be new to us was actually reprinted. And um, so many German Marxists, for example, were of these discussions. But I want to just look at a couple of phrases in there, and particularly the idea of the party. Um, and comrades think will be aware that in the 19th century, when not just Marxists, but others use the term party. They used it, I think, in a very different way than, than we do. Um, they used it, I think, to mean a very broad current. And we, we know, for example, on previous sessions where we've looked at the manifesto of the Communist Party, that at that stage, Marx and, and others consider the Communist Party to be a sort of broad current of communist ideas rather than a clearly organized party as we would understand it. A group like the Communist League and indeed other uh, groupings of that sort would be would would have a much clearer definition as an organization. So when Marx is talking about the party which is growing spontaneously everywhere on the soil of contemporary society, he actually means that the ideas associated with the Communist League and indeed of uh, scientific communism are developing spontaneously, and in particular in relation to the growth of industry and the growth of industrial proletariat. But it's also important to note that um, there is something of a hiatus uh, in Marx's political activity between the uh, early 1850s and 1864. And these are not years in which he sort of takes a holiday or um, he uh, goes off and discovers himself, as it were. But a period when he's, he's writing, for example, quite a lot of the economic work that will form capital is being written in this late, this period, eight, late 1850s to uh, the uh, you know early middle 1860s. But it's um, it's interesting that he he sees more value in developing theoretical ideas, and and much of this is to do with I think the sense that the, the real living movement has been defeated and that it is now important to try to analyze and particularly to look at the nature of society. Um, the, the Communist League, and again, I think comrades will have picked up some of this from the discussion last week, was a small grouping, um, but by the early 1850s, it had some adherents in uh, in France and in Germany, but it, its main existence was as an exile group in London. And as a small theoretically formed grouping, it, it, it was developing, you know, very high level of politics. Um, you know, it's there that Marx is sort of testing out his ideas. 
and indeed is it's an explicitly uh, communist grouping. But what Marx, uh, I think, is now looking at is to, to see how the ideas of communism, particularly those which he's developed already in both the Communist Manifesto, can now apply to the new situation. He's building, in a sense, on the experience of 1848 and the Communist League. But what I think he begins to understand in the, um, in the early 1860s, and certainly it comes across in 1864, is that we are now in a, perhaps a new period in which there's a, a, a reawakening uh, of that way, of that movement. Now, the changes that uh, occur in Europe, well, in fact, internationally, between the early 1850s and the 1860s, are not just the, the, the growth of, uh, of, of industry and the growth of a proletariat um, in, in the major industrial uh, countries, France, Belgium, Germany, Britain, uh, to a certain extent in Italy and Spain as well, but much less so. But also um, the growth of workers' organisations. For example, in Britain from the late 1850s, the growth of trade unions, initially quite local, but then taking on national form and extending um, into new groups of workers. And this is a clear sign, again, of um, a, you know, a developing type of, uh, of movement. The, the other aspects which are important is the growing sort of revival of the demand for the right to vote. And so uh, movements for extending the suffrage, uh, again, building on chartism, but taking a very different form, again, are also coming to the fore. The, the formation of the Reform League in 1866, I think, is a, an example of that. But the, um, the other changes, I think, are perhaps geopolitical, uh, to use the rather grand term, but particularly the growth of national movements in Europe. Remember that 1848 was had both a, a social and a national dynamic. So that, for example, demands for the unification of Italy, particularly from you know radical demands of the sort that would give rise to Garibaldi and Mazzini or their types of uh, nationalism, but also um, the emergence of sort of state projects. So, for example, a series of national wars in which uh, France uh, supports uh, the uh, Piedmontese in their attempts to reunify uh, areas of Europe, and, sorry, areas of Italy under their control. So the national question, uh, particularly in relation to Italy and, of course, to Germany, uh, the, the um, early 1860s sees um, Bismarck becoming minister president of Prussia. And uh, from that time onwards, beginning a policy of um, unifying Germany under Prussian control in 1866. Um, there is a um, um, war between uh, Prussia and Austria, which is, again, marks, I suppose, the real emergence of Prussia. So in terms of in terms of the, the world of the 1860s, there's a lot happening and, you know, a, a sense that the uh, the reactionary period after the defeat of the uh, 1848 revolutions, the, the crushing of the revolutionary movements, the disintegration of Chartism has now been placed by, you know, dynamic forces both in terms of um, uh, ideas of democracy, but also of the working class as well. And then, of course, the, the American Civil War in the 1860s is again a, a significant feature. So the, the important point here, I think, is that Marx is, in a sense, drawn back into activity by you know, these developments. And indeed, I suppose, begins now to think, how can uh, the ideas of communism and how can the working class movement uh, be, taken, uh, be taken forward? Um, one of the things that I, I perhaps want 
to discuss over the whole course of the sessions. I mean, I will be doing some other comrades will as well, but it's particularly about the, the sort of arguments about socialist consciousness and about how people become not just socialists, but revolutionaries. And in particular, uh, when Marx in that uh, letter says that the party is growing spontaneously everywhere on, everywhere on the soil of contemporary society. Comrades will remember that in the Communist Manifesto, Marx does sketch the development of class conflict. And he talks about that building uh, to a height and the, the way that the, the workers will combine in trade unions, they will grow aware of their class consciousness and from this revolutionary politics will develop. Now, that, is, that has often led to a debate along with, with other uh, Marxist texts, for example, in terms of the German ideology on the, the question of social consciousness and social being, about whether Marx in this period, or indeed Marxists in general, have this sort of idea of inevitability. In other words, that capitalism and its exploitation will inevitably create particular types of class consciousness. And it's very clear from Marx's own political activity that he didn't view that. I mean, otherwise, why did he spend time editing newspapers, forming groups, and in a sense, trying to educate and persuade? So he certainly had what we might think of as a sort of revolutionary project. And the idea that uh, to develop uh, a working class movement was not simply uh, an inevitability that would flow out of capitalism. You can certainly look at the sections in the Communist Manifesto, which are very inspiring. They're very, they're, they're brilliant literature, but they are written, I suppose, in somewhat in the heat of a, of a moment. And the, um, you know, that implication of a sort of determinism can be read into them. But I think in practical terms that Marx is like, you know, a whole range of people involved in politics, see politics as sub subject action and agency. Now, we might argue about, uh, about the nature of that agency. And indeed, we might argue about the nature of the consciousness of the working class, what will come up. Uh, later on, particularly in the discussions, I think about, uh, you know, about Lenin's work in what is to be done and the interpretations of that is this, this argument about how far this consciousness, um, you know, develops and indeed the role of organized um, activists and politicians and indeed the, the whole issue of the intellectuals, those who've thought and developed ideas and their relationship to political movements. So Marx is, in a sense, uh, you know, developing these ideas. And the first international is a good example of where this, um, this, where this may be the case. I would argue that, for example, the Communist League was clearly uh, an attempt at a propaganda group that was developing ideas, which would then go out to a wider movement and, um, you know, Marx's debates with Weitling and others in, in the 1840s and 1850s is a good example of, of where that, I suppose, to, you know, use the phrase, uh, that sort of praxis is being developed. Now, the, the, the first international was not an initiative undertaken by Marx. I'm sure you know, quite a lot of comrades are aware of that, but it's important to say that Marx was invited along um, the uh, the original um, sort of elements of it were the connections between French and British workers, which had arisen in the early 1860s, um, and groups of uh, French and British trade unionists wanted to cooperate together, particularly on matters of mutual interest, but particularly on questions of strike breaking, um, the way that employers might bring in workers from other countries to break strikes. So initially, the, the links were between sections of French and British trade unionists. There were also one or two others. Um, the, the chair of the meeting, Professor Beasley, was a, a positivist, uh, I suppose, a sort of social reformer. Um, and there were other sort of elements who considered the idea of, uh, of a group that 
linked up the interests of working men and you know the language of the time indicates i suppose its limitations of, of working men um you know in the interest of the working class um the um the meeting in september 1864 um again sort of came out of a number of uh, protest movements and campaigns particularly movements, for example, in sympathy and solidarity with Poland, um, which is, uh, was then largely part of the Tsarist Empire. There were elements of Poland in uh, Prussia and also Austria-Hungary. But um, solidarity with there, obviously with the American Civil War, and also, I suppose, the growing question in Britain of the, uh, of the franchise and uh, whether uh, whether workers will, or sections of workers will get the vote. Now, if you look at the letter that's dated the 4th of November, 1864, which is from uh, Marx to Engels, um, Marx is quite excited uh, about this. And um, he writes um, to uh, Engels, he's already been, um, since the meeting took place in, I think, mid-September, He's already been involved in a series of meetings. And again, he's, he's drawing up documents and uh, involved in committees and so on and so on. So he's been fairly busy since the foundation meeting. And um, he writes to Engels that he says that I knew that the time, that this time real powers were involved both on the London and Paris sides. So that this wasn't just um, someone proclaiming you know, a new movement that it actually represented something, and he talks about it being a real power. But he um, he outlines the meeting and he talks about the sort of people that are there, who he describes in quite colloquial time uh, terms as fine fellows, nice lads, and he runs through them people that that, that Engels would have known as well. Um, you know, trade union leaders who will later become quite important. Um, in the uh, in in the first international, um, but he goes on to say it will take time before the reawakened movement um, allows the old boldness of speech. It will be necessary to be, and this is where my very bad Latin. Uh, you'll have to I'll have to apologise for this, like all my languages. It will necessary to, to be fortitier in re, suaviter in modo which uh, is variously translated. It's actually the motto of a school very near where I live. Um, strong in deed or strong in essentials. Ray is a bit of a difficult one sometimes, but strong in deed, gentler in style. And that sort of idea of um, maybe adapting and maybe trying to relate your ideas to the audience and the degree to which you might um, shape and refine your ideas, and indeed how far you could go in developing revolutionary communism to a particular audience is an interesting one. And again, this, of course, is very similar to debates in our own day about whether um, you know, certain types of maximum demands and the idea of transitional politics and whether we, uh, we put forward particularly um, uh, you know, you know, particular demands in you know particular ways. I'll leave it at that because it's a theme I'm going to look at. And I know what I would ask comrades to do is particularly look at the documents that that Marx wrote for the First International and and see how they they weigh up both in terms of that phrase, but also in terms of you know Marx's earlier writings like the Communist Manifesto which obviously is designed for a very overtly revolutionary period. And also to contrast Marx's writing in this period with um, what um, he's, um, he's writing, for example, in the Civil War in France or the critique of the Gotha program um, when, the, uh, when the German socialists come together in that way. Um, the... Um, there was a, provi um, a provisional uh, general council or committee was established pretty, um, pr 
pretty early on and Marx was brought onto it. A number of people were given uh, the job of writing rules and addresses. And when these uh, when these came back to the committee, Marx saw them and was very critical and was in the end given the job of drafting them. And they were generally accepted with some some minor amendments. Again, I have, uh, I'm fortunate enough to have the minute books here of those meetings, which show the sort of to and fro. Um, and these will be available in some, uh, some libraries. Um, but uh, the Marxist online archive has got some sections of them, but I'm afraid Lawrence and Wishart um, have, um, have, you know, asked others to be taken down. So the pictures are a little incomplete. Um, Marx described his inaugural address as a sort of review of the adventures of the working class since 1845. And it's very clear that in this, the, there are the echoes of the Communist Manifesto. So, for example, it begins with um, quite a long outline of the growth of capitalism and um, the, uh, the, the fact that capitalism ex has expanded wealth and production. Um, and uh, you will see there um, the, um, you, you know, the, 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 the focus on the gulf between the wealth of industry and the growth of capitalism and the poverty of the working class. And that is clearly, you know, influences, that's clearly influenced by the arguments of the, the Communist Manifesto. But uh, it is certainly a more cautious language. Um, but it also brings through some of the key ideas. So again, Marx surveys the gains that the working class have made and refers, for example, to the way that the combinations of workers, trade unions and, and protest movements and others have managed to secure some gains. For example, the 10 hour act, where he talks about the political economy of the working class in confrontation with the political economy of the bourgeoisie. Now that would seem to us a fairly sort of straightforward, you know, idea. But of course, uh, for many of the trade union leaders, and indeed even for some of the more ostensibly radical French uh, Proudhonists, um, you would find um, you would find a certain sort of a set of uh, assumptions that often, in a sense. Uh, who incorporated capitalist common sense. In other words, that they, they were arguing for a fair day's wage, for a fair day's work. They didn't, for example, attack bourgeois political economy. They just wanted their fair share of it. So in putting forward that argument, Marx is clearly saying, well, there's the interests of the working class and those of the capitalists are rather different. Um, the... The, the, the carryover from, I think, the Communist Manifesto is the focus on politics, and in particular, the argument that to conquer political power has become the great duty of the working classes. And this in particular is linked to the interventions of the working class movements um, in uh, what is, in effect, foreign policy. So, for example, the protest movements about uh, Italy protest movements um, about uh, Poland, and above all, the protest movements um, uh, the, 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 the protest movements around the American Civil War. I'm afraid I can't keep up with the chat that goes on, um, so, but I can see that Matthew is you know, basically putting the correct view about the importance of the Civil War for the first international. And in particular, Marx's argument, and I think this is quite important, is not only the heroic sacrifices of uh, sections of the British working class in Lancashire, but also the um, direct intervention restrains the British ruling class from siding with the South. The, uh, not only did the mill owners uh, have their own interests in terms of, uh, you know, siding with the South, but the British uh, the British ruling class had very close connections with the South and indeed saw and indeed as, as would have seen the Confederacy as a, a probable sort of protectorate for British imperialism. Um, so 
that I think is quite important. And for Marx, it's the active intervention of the working class, not just commenting, but actually by carrying out protest actions, shaping and confronting the, the, the high politics and the foreign policy. And it's interesting that, that this is a really quite an important feature. Um, if we think of the British working class movement as being largely concerned with sort of bread and butter issues has often been sort of put forward, then um, the role of, of workers' solidarity movements, and even I would say, you know, the fairly sort of lib, lib lab trade union leaders often were very clearly in support of um, and, and opposed to repressive governments overseas and in Europe. I mean, that, that might fit in with the interests of the British ruling class on occasion. So, you know, that it's not that they were in, always standing out against it, but in the case of the American Civil War, they were. Um, so the, the American Civil War, I think, is quite an important example for, um, for Marx of how this de reawakening movement, as he calls it, can become actually a force. And he talks in the in the address about the um, the role of this movement in what he calls the mastery of high politics. That it, it should now began to con be considered a power in and of itself. And indeed, the way that the international acts it acts as if it is in a sense an international player. And um, you will see this, for example, when it sends letters and addresses to President Lincoln. Again, there's one of them that I've put up there. And it does achieve a lot of publicity and indeed gets a response from uh, President Lincoln. So this, I think, is again saying that the working class is a force in the world and not just a force for demanding wage increases and its share, but in a sense, it has its own political interests. And um, you know that, I think, is, uh, is quite important. Now, the General Council, um, it, it's, uh, it's elected. If you look at the rules of the, uh, the, um, the provisional rules, you'll see how it's laid out. Um, it's, it is, in a sen essentially, though, a body that is centred in London. It has, um, it's made up of um, delegates who are resident in London and in a sense are, you know, political exiles. Um, so although it has corresponding secretaries, as they're referred to, uh, from particular countries who do maintain links with the particular countries where the international has a presence, in many ways, the, the General Council is quite a central body. And in that sense, I think it it does tell us something about both how Marx and others see the development of a, of a party or a movement as opposed to um, simply just relying upon its spontaneous growth. The, the center or the, or the leaders of that and the, the leading figures are the people who are in a sense defining the politics. Now they do that in interaction with their with their comrades throughout the world, initially, you know, primarily in Europe, although very quickly they develop links with North America as well. But they see uh, the development of any movement as relying upon the development of a particular program. And the rules of the, um, the, the provisional rules do outline, you know, the clear aims about the self-emancipation of the working class and that that is the task of the working class that you know which is now sort of embodied and emboldened on you know most left wing programs is is the key aim of the international in in that way but of course um it's um uh, as a movement it's it's variable both in quality and nature um we do have figures and data about memberships uh, you know the nature of this movement. It was um, it was primarily certainly uh, for much of its life before the late 1860s. It was primarily a, a delegate and affiliate body, 
Its main strength lay in affiliates in Britain, trade unions, probably an affiliated membership of between 30 and 50,000 of uh, similar types of affiliations in France, um, much weaker affiliations in Germany, and also some in Belgium, uh, particularly in the industrial areas of Wallonia, and uh, also in, um, in uh, the French-speaking areas of Switzerland, but, but also in the German areas too, to a certain extent. Individual membership was actually quite small. And um, this, again, is where this movement has, I think, its, um, you know, contradictions and it's very clearly a, a movement that's developing. So the, the individual move membership in Britain may well have been as low as 350 people. And some of the reports from Germany in the, uh, in the middle to late 1860s suggest quite small memberships. You know, for example, 20 members in Leipzig you know, 15 in, in Cologne. So quite quite small uh, memberships in that way. Um, it also, I suppose, had different, um, you know, different sort of patterns of appeal. So for, for many of the trade unionists, and this was particularly true of many of the Swiss trade unionists, they saw the international initially as a sort of workers' defense organization so that in a period of strikes they would receive both assistance in you know monetary assistance but also that they might um, you know prevent black legs and scabbing in general um whereas other um, other groupings saw the saw the, the politics of this much more clearly and indeed also saw the international as a sort of um, educative uh, organization Marx certainly saw that. Um, he, again, the minutes tell us, spent a great deal both in the general council meetings but elsewhere organizing lectures, particularly on Marxist conceptions of economics and banging home the basic sort of differentiations uh, between capitalist economics and the, the, the capitalist class and the interests of the workers in that way. But also, um, Marx wanted to in a sense, uh, show um, to the working class, you know, the potential that they had. And this, again, meant, you know, a certain amount of publicity. And indeed, uh, the, um, the address to President Lincoln did receive uh, coverage in the Times, uh, as did um, the, the Polish agitation. So again, you can see here that this is, this is a movement which is sort of taking on recognizably uh, modern forms. Um, the the other elements in the um, in the movement, which will become more important, I think, uh, later, and will be we will look at when we come to talk about Germany, are the various workers' education groupings. Uh, in Germany, the working class movement did arise often from bourgeois liberal uh, educational bodies. And these often study circles then began to look at politics in the wider sense. And many of these became affiliated to the international. But also, pardon me, also they were the, um, the basis for those larger parties, which uh, we, we will consider as a separate topic, and their relationship to the international, the Lasallians, uh, and then the, uh, the, the people known generally as Eisenach, as people from uh, central Germany, um, they, um, they also have relationships with the, uh, with, with the international. Um, Marx is, you know, quite intimately involved in the, the organization of this group. You know, he attends meetings. Um, if comrades uh, ever get a chance to look at the minute books, um, there's a certain sort of familiarity. Um, those comrades who, for example, are on the Labour Left Alliance uh, steering group may want to look at the minutes and just wonder whether we've come much further than 1864 when we look at the nature of what's being discussed about fundraising, about organising meetings. And indeed, even uh, a, a drearily familiar topic, the quality of printing. Um, again, at one of the early meetings, uh, 
Uh, there's a complaint about the quality of the membership cards and their return to the printers uh, on the grounds that they're just not up to scratch. Um, and the, the bit I particularly enjoyed was the looking at the London conference, which was the first real conference of the international in 1865, is the uh, social arrangements. Um, um, tea would be available from six o'clock. There would be a dance. There would be music. Um, so those of you who like your mazorskas or waltzes, you've had plenty of chance to uh, strike your staff in, in a rather respectable Victorian manner in 1865. Uh, we're also informed that wine, uh, spirits, uh, stout and beer would be available at tavern prices. So um, you can see that you know, this is a, an organisation that you know has a, a real political life, and it, it is you know it's developing. It's drawing on all of its different traditions, and in the case of London, those traditions, um, you know, because the international is centred there, are often drawn from the exile groupings from people who've been in England for quite a while, but also you know the the, uh, the, the, the you know the native working class as well. Who are you know being drawn into polit political activity? Um, Marx um, Marx did not attend uh, many of the congresses. Um, the way that he functioned, and, and this was often for issues of health, um, but also it it's often was quite dangerous. I think to travel on the continent. Indeed, so we will discover later on in another session. Um, Governments would repress uh, the international, uh, suppress its newspapers, arrest people, and particularly after the time of the Paris Commune. Um, so um, he, the way that Marx seems to have worked, and I think again it's interesting in terms of wanting to establish a sort of record and above all develop, I suppose, a position, was through uh, working with groups of comrades. Um, and in particular, um, develop, developing, I suppose, a sort of support base and putting ideas on paper or in, a, or in pamphlet form. And a good example of how this would sort of function um, is, uh, is a document that was, um, was used at the, um, the uh, Geneva Conference of 1866. Again, it's... Um, it's called it's sort of instructions for general council delegates. And what this is, is sort of an outline of positions that the general council should take in relation to the debates that are coming up. And uh, this is a good example of uh, the type of political debates and indeed the very sharp differences that emerge in the international. Uh, next week, Ian is going to look at the, the issue of uh, the anarchist and Bakunin. But before those battles open up in the late 1860s, um, Marx's ideas are starting to run into opposition from uh, an older source, uh, the Proudhonists, particularly based in, um, in France, but also some in other uh, parts of Southern Europe and also in Switzerland as well. And his instructions, uh, this, the instructions given to the delegates of the General Council at the Congress sort of outline a set of positions and arguments, and they do, in a sense, represent a program for the international. And they talk about the importance of the struggle for reforms, and in particular, the struggle to secure legislation to secure workers' rights around working hours and conditions and so on. But they argue that the struggle for reforms is, you know, part of the struggle. And this is interesting in the sense that it runs counter to the Proudhonist view that uh, legislation and indeed immediate struggles, strikes in particular, are not only, um, you know, fruitless, but actually quite counterproductive. Also, uh, also Marx argues that the trade unions are a sort of growing um, you know, throw up the growing possibility of developing political consciousness and that the sign of workers' organisation will be the first sign 
towards a, a more developed political consciousness. And again, this is where we, we, we come to this debate about, you know, how far um, Marx is prepared to cooperate with bodies which are clearly not revolutionary and are also, in the case of many of the British leaders, will um, eventually be become sort of open collaborators with the Liberal Party, particularly after the um, Second Reform Act of 1867, when sections of the Labour aristocracy get the vote. But Marx still sees these the growth of these unions and indeed the, the, the trade unions as some sort of potential basis for working class organisation. Uh, above all, um, I think that what we're getting here is also the importance, again, of the political agency of the working class and that the working class has to take its own independent position. Um, in a number of discussions, particularly before the Franco-Prussian War, for example, the position that's be, going to be taken on the Austro-Prussian War, um, there's a discussion about whether groups of workers should side with one uh, state or another. And the idea of the workers taking their own position and not simply saying that's the job of, of the state leaders, you know, we're, you know, we, we don't have a position on this, I think is important. Marx is, is constantly stressing that this, um, you know, this has to be done in that way. Now, the Prudenists um, were uh, quite a strong force, but um, they were politically defeated and certainly after the Brussels Conference of 1868, they had, um, in a sense, retreated. Many of many of their uh, supporters, particularly in France, had either deserted the movement or had, um, um, you know, moved closer towards Marx's position. Now, Marx worked with a number of allies, and increasingly, from the the, the late 1860s, those allies are to be found in Germany and uh, of course in uh, amongst the British trade unionists. I use the phrase English because that's the one that comes up uh, and in fact it, to call them English isn't really accurate. Many of the unions and many of the affiliates are actually throughout uh, what was then the United Kingdom but uh, the habit of referring to um, Great Britain or the United Kingdom as England is one that comes through in the texts so I'm afraid I've, I've kept it, but I'm sure comrades will understand in that way. So I've uh, I've sort of drawn towards the end of the period I want to look at, which is really getting the international up and running. Um, it's it has an existence. Its membership is is various. It's it's run on a shoestring, and although there are lurid re revelations about. Um, you know, the international having half a million pounds at its disposal, the Times runs various expose, or that it is a, an army of millions just poised to uh, rise up and murder the bourgeoisie in their beds. Um, and this sort of story does the rounds, particularly at the time of the, um, at, at the time of the Paris Commune. In practice, uh, the movement is patchy. But what I think it is, is you know, evidence of Marx is an attempt to develop revolutionary ideas in a new movement that is starting to take place. And he does that with really the forces that are at hand. He does that, I think, as well, remaining fairly consistent to the ideas that he puts forward in the Communist Manifesto. It's very clear, for example, in his educational talks that he gives that there's absolutely no concession to bourgeois ideas. And it's also clear that his focus on politics and that the, 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 the working class movement has to be more than just around, uh, you know, economic demands is also there. Um, but I think it will be more interesting to look at the debate which will take place when the German uh, socialists, many of whom were um, had a you know rather uh, arm's length relationship with the international initially. Um, how they began to organise and then how that began to influence uh, Marx and Engels um, in terms of how they saw development of party and programme. So I see this as a period in which ideas are developing and I think Marx is definitely building on the experience. But as he said in his letter in November 
1864. These are real powers. And, you know, how we orientate to those powers is, I think, quite important. So I'll, I'll leave it there and throw it open to uh, questions and discussion. I'm afraid I think I've spoken a little longer than I intended. Um, no worries. You weren't there last week, so you used the slot from, from last week as well because you were off poorly. Thank you very much, Kevin. Really interesting introduction, touching on a, a lot of issues that, as you say, will no doubt come back um, in the next 10, 12 sessions. Comrades, if you want to make a contribution or have a question, please click raise hand. If you can't find it, it's usually under reactions. If you can't find it, Put it in the chat um, and I'll call you in. It's much better than writing your question in the chat. Um, it's much better to hear how you how you actually mean it rather than me reading it out. Um, I thought it was really interesting um, to get the ball rolling to see um, that he was quite prepared to stay out of it for a while when you know the movement was was going backward, etc. And use the time, as you said, to you know preparation for the next period when things are changing again. Um, I've looked up this, um, the quote you mentioned, you may, where you said he's, um, he was talking about um, the, the movement is now growing spontaneously. It actually says naturally, which is a slight, slight difference to spontaneously. But that, that discussion does come up um, later again also with... Uh, Just on that, is, you, did you look that up in German? Uh, I, I can't find it in the German, but it says in the English, uh, naturally. Because so mine... My um, my translation, which was one from um, uh, Franz Mehring, which had um, had been done for in the Neue Zeit about 1911, 1912, um, does use um, spontaneously. Oh, because I looked it up on the on the Internet Archive on that on that yeah. link. But it might be useful. It might be useful for you, um, you know, to look at it in German because one thing yeah. I've been very aware. Um, you know, and you know my German is pretty dreadful. But oh. even not, uh, no, 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 no. Uh, it, I can order a beer, but I can't discuss materialism. Um, but the, it, it strikes me that often, um, you know, and often the translations can be, you know, it can be quite significant. And I'm not on about deliberate distortions. I'm on about, you know, um, just simply simplifications you know I'm, I'm sure you're aware of this problem because you translate yourself yeah and we've discussed it last week with the communist uh, manifesto where there was quite a, a serious mistranslation we've discussed this about the the party question you know should the communists organize in a party uh, or should they never ever organize separately etc so it's quite a mistranslation often yeah i think it's more um sometimes perhaps wishful thinking or sometimes mostly, you know, just you think that's the right thing because that's where your politics are and it actually means something totally different. Um, what I, I did, uh, the, the the letter about, he, he writes about the first international to Engels, I, I urge comrades to to read it. It's, it's, it's quite funny when you read letters that were, they probably didn't expect perhaps to have published uh, like that, but it is, he is kind of... Um, talking about how he maneuvered you know because he couldn't he couldn't attend a couple of meetings and then so he basically maneuvered because of what they produced the other the other committee produced was absolute rubbish and he went into a editing meeting with as he says you know the clear intention not to let one single line stand of what they put together and then he sort of you know goes for time oh we must so they spend until midnight to agree on one rule out of 40 and then ah. Oh, Oh, it's a shame. It's got no time now. Leave it to me. I'll look over it and stuff. And he changes the whole thing and, you know, rewrites it all. And then they say, yeah, yeah, you, you've done exactly what we hoped you would do. <laughs> you totally tore it up, etc. It's quite, quite funny. It's an entertaining read as well. Um, but on that question, perhaps we could discuss this a, a little, a little longer. And this is, this is, of course, the, the key question, you know, growing spontaneously, growing naturally, or does it need the input of the revolutionaries? I mean, this is a, a, a as you said, what is to be done, does uh, talk about that. And, but, but also, you know, this is, this comes up now, where do, where do we fit into the party? You know, where do the revolutionaries fit into taking what's happening anyway? Workers who come up against the limits of, you know, what capitalists are prepared to give them, they will 
automatically, naturally, spontaneously come up against that. They will want to fight for higher wages. They will want to fight for better working conditions, etc. But, um, you know, how do we get them beyond that, etc.? Will that happen spontaneously? Will that happen naturally? Or is that where, you know, you need the party of, of some sort? And that is also interesting. And perhaps if you could... Um, mention that again this the party wasn't the same party that we're talking about you know when we're, we're talking about the communist party when when they often write about the the party they meant like the movement for socialism i guess you know the those who understand that we have to go beyond the sort of economic self-interest of of the workers and we have to you know it's not an inevitability that workers will automatically overthrow capitalism quite the opposite is perhaps even you know it's not going to happen unless you have a party of organized opposition with a clear understanding what kind of program we need I, it's not inevitable it's not spontaneous it has to be prepared it has to be worked for etc but that's an that's an interesting um discussion and I, I presume they came up against those issues as well in in the first international there's a lot of questions in that one question um but perhaps you have a, a couple of comments before i bring in comrades from the floor yeah just a, a quick couple of comments um if you look at the relevant sections of the communist manifesto uh, on bourgeois and proletarian or bourgeois and proletarian sorry um you can see references there to the development of both militancy and you can see the arguments about the difference between the proletarian revolution and the bourgeois revolution particularly the idea of the proletariat as a universal class that by abolishing uh, the conditions of its oppression you know abolish oppression in general whereas the bourgeoisie abolishes its revolution abolishes the conditions of its oppression but not that that's not universalized um it's uh it's unclear i think in the in the text of the communist manifesto um other than the references to the party and uh other than i think and i think these are quite important points the critiques of the various forms of socialism in other words it, it what marx thinks is that it's quite important to um, you know, critique these other socialisms because it is a battle of ideas, and it isn't just something that um, you know can be left to occur naturally. That you know, wrong ideas, incorrect ideas, even reactionary ideas can can emerge. So I think that that although I think it isn't entirely or as clearly spelled out as it will be later on, I think it's clearly there. I don't think we're imposing that on Marx. In terms of um, the issue of the party and indeed of organised politics, this does come up in the first international, not just in terms of um, some of the English trade unionists, um, but also in terms of the prudenists who are quite hostile to what they see as intellectuals. And there's a certain sort of workerism, particularly sort of our artisan forms of workerism, and, uh, you know, Marx is quite argues that, you know, people who are committed to the politics of the working class can be members of, of this movement. Whereas, you know, some want to uh, simply confine it to particular groups of workers. And um, that, I think, is, again, a sort of argument that this movement and that the importance of politics goes just beyond mere representation of workers uh, in that way. And I suppose um, I suppose the other um, the other lesson, particularly coming out of Chartism, is that although the base of Chartism is is that of a mass working class movement, there are many currents within it. Indeed, in you know, its origins often lie among sections of both the petty bourgeoisie, even indeed, you know, some sections of the bourgeoisie as well. And that, I think, then makes the idea of a battle for um, establishing a political position quite important. And, of course, what the 1848 revolution throws up as well 
is clearly the distinction between the politics of the working class and the bourgeoisie. And so the idea of, you know, developing that consciousness politically, of raising political demands, and that is carried out by members of the party of, of this current, is, I think, quite central. I think... I think um, um, sorry, I think I'm getting a little bit of an echo there, yeah. Um, so I think, for example, the Proudhonists often do tend towards these ideas of spontaneity. They tend... Um, to see many of the uh, developments in capitalism occurring, if I use the word inevitably, that uh, isn't quite how they see it, but it, it, it's much less on the active political intervention of revolutionaries. And I think this is the central point. Now, you know, th how that's to be done, I think, is evolving in this period. I don't think there's a sort of clear blueprint as yet, but it's clearly not something of... Um, just assume that it will, quote, naturally happen. You know, workers will be impelled into struggle. They may even raise political demands, but that will require to further those demands and the pushing will require both organisation and also a uh, programme as well. Mm. Yeah. Thank you, Corey. OK, now from the floor, we've got a few people with their hands up. So try to keep it succinct, please, comrades. Um, Jerry, please. Okay, uh, just a few small points. Um, the, 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 the thing about the propaganda uh, and, 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 and the, 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 the mass action, um, I, 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 you know, a, a distinction was made at the time of the, of the Russian Revolution between uh, um, propaganda for the vanguard uh, and agitation for the masses. So you 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 wrote your communist manifesto, or you wrote your 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 your, your big propaganda document uh, in order to 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 win over the uh, uh, the vanguard, but you sought to put the, the the masses in 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 action by 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 agitation, agitational demands, like all parts of the Soviets are 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 uh, uh, the land, bread, and peace that 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 sort of stuff. So, so when when the workers began to move, um, you 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 especially put a, a lot of emphasis uh, on 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 the agitational uh, uh, on on the agitational demands. So, so that that's the the, the that's the difference there. So, so um, in, in 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 you, you know you, you you do then have to have some kind of a link. Between your 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 agitational demands and your propaganda, and that's what I would call a transitional demand. God save the mark, uh, if it doesn't insult too many people. I I, I think um, you know people that say, well, you you take what's possible, uh, uh, or you take you 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 put forward what's needed and not what's possible. You look at what's possible and you find a link between what's possible and and what's needed uh, in your whole program. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Kevin, do you want another question or do you want to answer that? No, I'll bring, I'll bring a couple together. I think okay. that would help, yeah. Yeah. John, please. Oh, we can only see your chest at the moment, John. Could move your camera up a bit. And you have the trouble, I think, unmuting. I've sent you, there should be a, a, a link on the screen that you have to touch when I click unmute. Doesn't quite work. Um, shall we try and bring somebody else in and you try and sort it, comrade? Because I don't think we can. Oh, oh, I think I've, I've, heard, think I've, well, I've heard myself. Well, I've heard myself. John? John? Can you try and try and Nope, nope, doesn't, doesn't. Okay, okay. Nick, Nick, then, please. Sorry, Tina, Sorry, was, Tina. Was, was that me? Yes, you, you, you. Okay, okay. so there's so, a bit so, of a okay. There is, isn't it? I'll try and sort it. Try now. Comrade Tina, can you? Yes, that's better. Thank you, uh, Tina. And thank you particularly to Kevin. I thought that was a really interesting discussion and a, a really good exposition about 
the first international. And um, I, I wanted to try and make some links between today and the first international and to address some misapplications, uh, as I see it anyway, um, of the lessons of the first international to how Marxists should intervene in the movement today. Um, so I hope that's not um, taking things in a, a, a different direction um, a, at all. But I, I want to preface the remarks by saying that you can't um, look at Marx's life without seeing his role in the First International and his achievement in the First International. I think Engels called it at one stage his crowning achievement, which is a bit a bit strange given that he wrote Capital. But um, it, it was certainly seen by Engels and I think by Marx at the time as being extremely important. So I'm not seeking to minimise it at all. And um, the, the point that I want to address is that at the moment, when people are looking around for what sort of party we should be building now, they look back, this is some Marxists, look back at the First International and say, well, Marx in the First International used his sort of Marx party, the people around Marx, his colleagues, his, his co-thinkers like Engels and, 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 and Wolf and so on. And they used that, but they, they related to British trade union leaders and they intervened in a movement that contained people that didn't agree with them. And that's what we should be trying to do now. Now, in my opinion, we we communists are a part of the working class and we are not apart from the working class. So it's always important that communists relate to discussion, debate and particularly activity in the working class. But how we do that in the present day, we can't simply just look back to Marx and Engels and see their participation in the first international as being a prototype or a, a model to follow for today, because that would ignore, in essence, 150, 160 years that has taken place since then and try to apply the method that Marx used to intervene to promote communist ideas in the movement at the time to what we and how we do it today. And it's interesting that after Marx died, Engels wrote to um, Vic, uh, Frederick Sorg, and he said, I think the next international, after Marx's writings have been at work for some years, will be directly communistic and will openly proclaim our principles. And that's clearly what was intended and what was expected and what was hoped for in the Second International, and particularly with the German party and the Erfurt programme and so on for the all the criticisms or some of the criticisms that can be directed at that. And again, um, when Marx told Engels that he was going to get involved in this movement, which became the International Working Men's Association, the first international, Engels initially, wrongly, was quite sceptical, but he did say, we're going to have to break with these people at some stage. And Marx said, yes, that's true, but um, not yet. And so it's trying to see, well, where are we now? Because we, we don't have just have the experience of the first international, that collapsed through um, a combination of differences and so on. Marx and Engels and, and the General uh, Council moved the headquarters to New York because of the, 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 the coming to the end, actually, of that, uh, that, that wave that you've talked about. And then we had the second international, the, the movement um, with Marxist parties. We then have August, 20, August 1914 and the capitulation of social democracy. We then have the third international. We have Stalinism. And we have the position today. So a whole lot of history has gone through. So the point that I'm getting to is that the, the argument that I would put forward today is that communists need their own party. And that doesn't mean a sectarian party that doesn't engage in the class struggle, but it means a party that argues for communist ideas, because I agree with Kevin and with you, Tina, that the conclusions that workers draw 
are not necessarily revolutionary or communistic. They may be, but they may take a long time to get there. And what, what is needed is a communist party, an organized communist force that intervenes and brings the good news of communism or socialism to the class. And if you look at what Marx was trying to do in the First International, it's quite amazing really how much he was able to get the First International to agree to. And in those um, provisional rules that Kevin talked about, I, I too have got the same, the same minutes. It's a fantastic uh, two, two volume book, book but the provisional rules of the association start out by saying, considering, and this is basically why the first international, that the emancipation of the working classes must be conquered by the working classes themselves. Right. So that, that's an amazing achievement for 1864. It's not even accepted by the social democratic or the trade union movement now. In, in 2023, and he goes on, and it, it's slightly different, as Kevin said, it's slightly emoliated, em, emoliated versions of the Communist Manifesto, but it's the same concept. He says in, number, in paragraph two, that the economical subjection of the man of labor to the monopolizer of the means of labor, that is, the sources of life, lies at the bottom of servitude in all its forms. Basically, he's saying capitalism is at the, the root of all the evils in society. And he's got all of these disparate forces to agree that. We, we, we'd be hard pressed to find a, a unified group of, of uh, workers today to agree to that particular concept. And that, to me, brings home why we need an organized communist force to present in various different ways through agitation and propaganda, but resolutely and confidently putting the arguments of Marx. So when Marx used that Latin motto, um, strong in deed or strong in the thing, you could also say strong in the argument, but uh, softly or gently in the manner, he, he, he's prepared to, you know, dress it up a little bit, but he's absolutely intransigent on the question of the politics of it. And he fights several, in fact, multiple battles from the Prudenists to the Lasallians to the trade union leaders and so on for his communist point of view. Whereas what we have at the moment, unfortunately, and I'll finish on this point, is some Marxists who aren't arguing for a new party in which they argue for their ideas, but for a new party in which they subordinate their ideas to the trade union left bureaucracy, which I think is a big mistake. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Um, Kevin, I suggest you um, uh, reply to some of the issues from the first two speakers. Yeah. Um, well, uh, we will, Jerry, get on to talk about, I think, the the Russian Revolution. And indeed, uh, you know, I'm hoping that the discussion on that will take that form. I mean, I was really, what I hope to do in the sessions here is really just outline the history. And um, I, I mean, I think the distinction between propaganda and agitation is interesting. And I think I would agree with your um you know, with your point about how that operated in the Russian Revolution and indeed in the, the preparations for that. But I think that at the stage that we are here in the 1860s, I think that Marx is probably uh, still working more in terms of looking at the vanguard. Uh, I, I think that that becomes quite clear as well in terms of how he operates, that he is still trying to build up a current of thought around his ideas and he's doing this with you know limited resources limited numbers in terms of building a revolutionary instrument uh you know such as the bolsheviks had um i think that's only going to be that's only going to appear to be on the agenda when we start to look at the paris commune and indeed uh, later but i'm not sidestepping the question on transitional politics 
I mean, I think it's really the subject of a of another talk, particularly when we come to look at the the airport program, that the whole idea of the minimum and maximum and what that means. But I I I I think that um, I think that it is a, an important point because I think that in Marx at this stage, even those um, those distinctions are not uh, are, are not clear. You know, when we look at um, when we look at the rules and the program uh, that 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 Nick referred to there, um, I would I would agree with much of what Nick said, um, and I. I don't particularly want to go too far down the road. It's not that I want to avoid talking about the contemporary, because I would generally agree with with what Nick said about the nature of a communist party and a specifically Marxist project. But I um I do think that the argument that we just simply go back and look at what Marx did and then we repeat it is is not indeed what Marx did. He didn't go back and repeat what he did in 1848. And he also didn't go back and repeat what previous groups of revolutionaries had done. Um, so he was, uh, in a sense, looking at the real movement that existed and how he was going to, um, you know, how he was going to intervene in that. Um, I think the emphasis on an education and um, and indeed, what what Marx and Engels thought they were doing with the first international is, I suppose, in many ways, educative. And I don't mean that in the sort of academic sense, but you're attempting to um, you're attempting to break uh, the hold of bourgeois ideology. And the sections that you you read, uh, and I did refer to the one on the emancipation of the working class. That runs counter to both the political economy of the prudenists, but also to those of the British trade union leaders who might well have seen um, the idea of emancipation as simply workers securing their fair share in that way. So it's it's it is uh, you know quite a clear um, challenge to them, and um, I think interestingly, it's one that will will come under a certain strain. And indeed, in the case of the trade union leaders, many of them will drift off. Uh, Howell, who's one of the um, members of the General Council in the 1870s, becomes um, a liberal uh, MP, Lib Lab MP. Um, in terms of uh, breaking and knowing when to break and so on, Marx, I think, had been through that experience with Chartism and um, remember that the Chartist movement, after its defeat, and it goes into decline, goes into all sorts of um, strange forms. And indeed, uh, I think it's it's in the letter that one of the letters I've quoted, where Marx talks about um, his views on some of the Chartist leaders, and particularly the ones, uh, I think it's Ernest Jones that he and, and Harney that he'd not been in contact with. And so there's a you know clear idea that on occasions or indeed that unless people are in a sense within your your current within your party within the Marx party if we want to call it that then there will be these distinctions. Um, and it was very clear, for example, when I, I I tried to make the point about the the instructions to the Geneva Conference that the prudenists um, you know that Marx was not going to allow any any real concessions to them. And of course, this will be even more so with Bakunin in the um, in the next section, which Ian will, will look at in that way. Um, as for the sort of lessons, well, I think I would prefer to see, look, we, we look at least, you know, the, the, the first two internationals and we, we sort of take lessons from those you know, I mean, the third international, I think, again, quite a lot there. But I I think we also have to sort of acknowledge where we are. Um, you know, we are not in the world of the 1850s and 1860s. Um, and I suppose that we, we have to recognise, for example, that there's a whole lot of historical experience. I mean, the experience of Stalinism, for example, um, the, um, you know, the 
the development of mass working class organizations, development of capitalism. I mean, I can, you know, I can go on for, for ages about saying, well, you know, what we've got to take into account. But what I think we perhaps can learn from this is that what Marx is uh, what Marx is clearly trying to do is to move beyond narrow circles. And that in particular, and this will I think will become apparent uh, in the next talk and uh, in the um, in the sections on German social democracy, make those clear delineations uh, that Nick refers to. Um, I mean, in terms of the situation today, I think it would be good, perhaps at the end of this, the series, to sort of focus on that. I don't want to say let you know that was then, this is now, and don't bring it in. But and I think it does have some sort of lessons, and it is quite useful. But it's clearly not a blueprint. But it 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 does, I think, give us some sort of guide, and it also talks about how we might operate in a situation when uh, the space for revolutionary politics is very limited. Um, so I'll, I'll I'll leave it there for the minute. Yep. Thank you, Kevin. Um, Victor, please, and then Matthew. Good evening, comrades. It's occurred to me that Marxism is almost meaningless if you do not first grasp the concept of an overwhelming majority mass of workers and proletariat being exploited by a small bourgeois minority of capitalists who are trying to exploit, manipulate and control. Not to accept that concept and call yourself a Marxist is almost like not believing in a monarchy, but calling yourself a monarchist. Not believing in Christ, but calling yourself a Christian. Not believing in racism, but calling yourself part of the Ku Klux Klan. Or calling yourself a Stalinist if you don't believe in Stalin. Uh, the idea of the capitalist bourgeois minority exploiting the proletariat and the workers is at the core of Marxist thinking. However, though we've been discussing in great minute time the history of uh, Marxist activity and thinking in great detail, we have very little discussion on the nature of the modern capitalist conspiracy to control workers, their welfare and power in society today. This has been brought home to us by the rise of here, I prefer Davos Stormtrooper, who besides preferring Davos, topic that the mainstream media refuses to question him about, a secretive organisation that you and I will never be allowed to go within a mile of, because it's exclusively for selected capitalist bosses and their tame politicians to discuss what they're going to do to us in secret. He is also a member of the Trilateral Commission. Another secretive organisation of capitalists gets its name because it's based in Japan, Europe and North America, of people who feel there's too much democracy, too much women's rights, too much workers' rights. If we'd have been more familiar with these secretive capitalist controlling organisations that operate behind the scenes, Perhaps so many of us wouldn't have been fooled and betrayed by Starmer in the way that we were. Do you think that we need to bring our Marxism up to date? 
and consider this fundamental core aspect of Nazism in some greater detail, comrades. Thank you. Thank you. Matthew, please. Just a few trying to yeah a few points very briefly. I think uh, I agree with a lot of what Nick has said. I just, I just say that we should take that point that his that he he makes about you know Marx talking about you know the working class and the need for you know uh, issue uh, as the core of the basically to 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 uh, end the uh, class society itself, not merely capitalism, but all class society actually goes back to, to at least the 1840s and it is actually core to Marx's uh, break with, with Hegelianism. Um, and, you know, the, the, the whole question is live, obviously, because what we've got, obviously, is a whole series of sets of people, you know, basically breaking from that uh, basis to say, well, the task of the working class is to liberate humanity towards, you know, support for, you know, Stalinism or um, Scottish nationalism or NATO or whatever else, other such nonsense but that, that that's happening all the time unfortunately i think the other thing the other thing is interesting in marx of course is that marx of course is very good at writing things he writes an extraordinary amount i mean you know i mean he, 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 his his writings are actually you know tons in weight of paper but he's very very bad at publishing any of it i mean the the, the thing is obviously that the, the great thing about yeah you know, he actually publishes capital during his own lifetime you know, uh, although it's five years late, at least. I mean, being beyond being Marx's publisher, it actually drove people to distraction. Um, <clears throat> but I mean, much of his work is not published. You know, for for many decades after his death. I mean, Grundrisse, which is which is a central work, is not actually available till after the Second World War. I mean, not even the common turn have access to Grundrisse. You know, so yeah, you can see. I mean, we're in the privileged position of having a lot more Marx available, you know, than, 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 than previous generations as well. I mean, we take that into account. The other thing I think that in terms of what, what happened, what's happening in terms of first international is what you're seeing is these two great mass mass movements. The first, the worst of which, of course, is, is, is the civil war in the in, in US, which is a mass movement. I mean, there is a, you know, obviously a, <coughs> in the British working class, I mean, what, what you see is a, a, a big campaign against slavery. I mean, you have US anti-slavery uh, campaigners coming over and running tours for decades in, in, in uh, all the way around the UK uh, and winning support and so on and so forth. And therefore there's political preparation for this support for 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 the North against against the slavery. Uh, and, and and the fact that the actually of course I mean the US Civil War itself is this is this mass movement in uh, against slavery. You know the, the US is able to as a I mean, country without I mean, nothing like the population it's got now able to raise an army of two million men, mostly men. I mean, there were a few disguised women, but mostly men, you know, on, on a volunteer basis. I mean, the, virtually you know, they did pass a conscription act, um, but virtually nobody was conscripted. 90, 90, over 90 percent of all that army was 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 uh, was was volunteer because people wanted to fight to get the same. Um, you know, so you have that. Uh, at the same, you know, same time also, but that actually is what impels Lincoln, who was very um, reluctant to to actually announce the Emancipation Proclamation. This armed movement behind him, you know, it's like okay, uh, in 1863 he announces this, you know, the, the Emancipation Proclamation, um, you know, freeing the slaves, which is both summer, you know, summary act of human liberation, massive act of human liberation, and at the same time, a huge act of expropriation. He expropriates, you know, all of these southern planters. You know, it's immense in, in, in historical terms. It's quite huge. This is why, I, you know, why, why uh, Marx and Engels are so effusive about it, I think. Um, at the same time, also, of course, that that movement then forces Lincoln to, to allow um, uh, black men to join the army. Um, you know, and, and also not only to join the army, but to have equal pay. Although unfortunately the US Army remains a segregated uh, institution until after the Second World War. But you know, that's, you know they, 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 they were finally able to, 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 to carry arms and receive the same pay as everybody else. Um, so there's that. And, and that's happening, that's that's important to the to the to the first international. And then, of course, obviously, even more central, of course, is, is the Paris Commune, in which the, 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 the you know members of the of the of the international actually play a central role. I mean, they're members of the commune, 
unfortunately, mostly Proudhonists, but there's then this sort of day and daily debate between Marx, Engels, and the, and the actual leadership of the commune, you know, so, which is an, an amazing, you know, sort of experience that, that it's a live experience of, you know, running the first workers' revolution. Um, that, that, you know, you have a live debate between you know, Marx obviously writing up all the, the, the lessons that you can see, and at the same time debating it out with the, the actual leadership. So, you know, it was an extraordinarily uh, uh, productive thing. And I think that's, you know, it's, it's, it's really um, incredibly useful in terms of the, the political development uh, of everybody concerned. Thanks. Thank you, comrade. And um, Paul wants to speak, but I think he might have a problem with his camera. I've allowed you to talk so we can hear you now if you want to speak. Paul Smith, please. That's okay, Tina. Hi. It's okay, you don't want to speak? That's right. Oh, okay, sorry, I misunderstood. You've got your hand up, but I think that might have been a mistake. Okay, um, Kevin, do you want to reply to a few things that were raised in the discussion then, please? Thank you. Yeah, uh, I'll start with Matthew. Thanks, Matthew, for uh, that. And also your chat comments on this, the American Civil War, which saved me a, a job, as it were. But um, I think you're quite right on the revolutionary impact of that war. Um, and when you just set out the terms of it in terms of an act of human libera liberation and undermining, you know, you know, an absolutely repulsive reaction, reactionary, but integral part of capitalism. You know, this wasn't some sort of antique uh, thing stuck away in the, an obscure corner of the world. It was directly linked to British capitalism. You know, the cotton which flows from the southern states comes into Liverpool and then is sent into the mills of Lancashire and to the warehouses of Manchester. Um, uh, you know, I, um, I would just a sort of small sort of local reference where I live in Liverpool. Um, it's, uh, it's not generally known, but it I think does deserve to be remembered that Liverpool's record on the American Civil War is pretty atrocious. Because if people on the Clyde were building ships, well, people on the other side of the Mersey built the Alabama, at least that, you know, the famous commerce raider. And indeed, uh, I think probably about 50% of the crew of the Alabama came from Merseyside. Um, and um, the, uh, the the local bourgeoisie, commercial bourgeoisie in Liverpool back to the, um, the Confederacy. Um, in 1863-64, I think, they held a great big fundraiser in St George's Hall and they raffled um, Stonewall Jackson's hat um, as a sort of prize. So, um, uh, you know, the uh, alongside the heroism of the, um, the Lancashire workers and their political initiative and that of the First International, there were sections of the, um, the British bourgeoisie who were quite willing to uphold you know, that foul system. And, you know, the, what, one of the things say about, you know, contemporary discussions on slavery and indeed, um, you know, imperialism in general is the idea that somehow British capitalism and, and liberal dem democracy is the, the antithesis. You know, British, the British bourgeoisie would have, were fully behind the Confederacy. Uh, but I think the revolutionary impact and in particular, not only the role of um, the first international and uh, comrades in this country, but also many of the, the, the so-called Red 48ers in the American army. I mean, the, the you know, the American, uh, the Union army was full of veterans of, of 1848. And indeed, I think Germans should get a particular mention there uh, because of, uh, of that. Many of the middle ranking and general officers were veterans of 1848. So the impact of the of the American Civil War, I think, is quite significant, you know, and it it, it can be sort of played down a little bit as peripheral. But I think you you brought it to the centre in an important way. Um, for those comrades who are interested, uh, there is a, a very general sort of bourgeois history book, you know, it's just almost a sort of bestseller. But it's called uh, A World on Fire. It was written, I think, about five, maybe 10 years ago 
and it's about Britain's connections with the American Civil War. And I think it's quite useful, um, you know, as a reminder. I, uh, I particularly enjoyed not only the embarrassment of the Gladstone family with, the, with, with William Gladstone's support for the Confederacy on grounds of self-determination. So those people in the Ukraine solidarity campaign have got a nice long um, glorious antecedents of backing reactionary causes using that slogan. But also um, the Guardian, which uh, backed uh, the South. Um, it did. It it did. Um, it did put it in its uh, recent uh, uh, centenary edition of bicentenary editions. But um, it just makes the point that the you know sections of the bourgeoisie were, you know, didn't have clean hands in that way. Um, I left off the Paris Commune, Matthew, because that's going to be a separate issue, and I deliberately just did the earlier earlier part. Um, Victor. Um, you, you know, you talk about uh, an analysis of contemporary capitalism, and I agree with you. I mean, you know, the documents that we've looked at, and this is an historical session, not not because it's an academic idea. You know, let's have a nice little bit of history, but because I think that we're looking at the development of Marxism. And Marx, when he writes that um, inaugural address does go straight for the uh, exploitation of the working class. And it goes straight for pointing out the, the difference between the growth of the British economy. And he uses all the figures from British official documents. So he, he, you know, he goes straight for that. And I think you're right to do that as well. Um, what he's also doing, and uh, you know, this refers back to some of the earlier questions, is he's also um, challenging the hold of bourgeois ideas in the labour movement, both Proudhonist ideas, but also amongst British trade union leaders, many of whom who might be quite militant in securing uh, or attempt, would try to be quite militant to secure a good deal for their members, but would not accept the idea of you know, the fundamental uh, nature of capitalism. So they might see capitalism and indeed profit as sort of almost eternally ordained. And when, when Marx is using that line about bourgeois political economy, he's actually challenging them. And again, I think that's important because the points you make about Starmer uh, and indeed trade union leaders and indeed what we might think as of the whole pro-capitalist wing of the leadership of our movement also have to be challenged in the same way. Where where I think that um, where I think that I would not not emphasise so much, but it's I think uh, is you know this is um, uh, I, I suppose because I'm looking at Marxism is his historical development is for example the role today of individual leaders and indeed groups that you refer to, which, you know, I've been aware of their existence, you know, meetings of capitalists and groupings and so on. You know, um, I, I think some of the first comments on those sorts of things occurred in the early 70s. I think that what Marx is arguing is not about secret organizations or indeed the, you know, the role of the ruling class in trying to suppress the movement, it's actually developing the consciousness in the working class. And that is our, our big issue. You know, there is at the moment no alternative uh, for workers. And so in the coming general election, they will either have to vote for Starmer or maybe for, um, or abstain or indeed vote for some small left candidate. But essentially workers are presented with two wings of capitalism in that sense. You know, the Labour Party, which is a bourgeois workers party still, has a leadership that's committed to capitalism. And it's had a leadership committed to capitalism from its very inception in 1900, because it grew out of the very same trade union leaders that Marx is challenging with his views on bourgeois political economy. So, you know, Starmer is, is a particularly odious example of that. Tony Blair was an odious example. But they're part of a long line of reformist leaders. And our, our function, I think, is 
is to challenge the ideas of reformism and that capitalism can be reformed and that laborism and that type of politics can give any permanent gains for workers. So, I, I, you know, the, the focus on Starmer is important, but it's not Starmer and it's not, I think, cabals and secrecies. It's actually the capitalist system and it's the structure of uh, bourgeois politics. And that, again, is, I think is what Marx was was attempting to do and what I think Marx should attempt to do, um, you know, is to raise up the points in that way. And particularly, you know, to begin the process of raising revolutionary consciousness. But, you know, that's that's really the heart of, of all of these talks. Yeah. Very good summing up. Thank you very much, Kevin. Um, there's nobody else to get hands up, so we're finishing about a little bit earlier than usual. That's that's not a big problem at all. Thank you for joining us. Next week, Ian Spencer will be looking at what happened with the first international. We've just discussed today how Marx was centrally involved in setting it up, writing the rules, etc., um, getting very much involved. And it came to a split, which was discussed. Uh, we mentioned that today, but next week we'll focus on on that debate, which is still happening today. That that debate between you know it's pointless going on strikes, pointless going um, dis uh, fighting for reforms, etc. So it'll be an interesting discussion. Looking forward to it. Uh, thank you very much, Kevin. Thank you all for coming.